Let's follow it up with a big hand for Terry Swack. <laughs> Terry, thank you. He'll join you in a seat. Thank you. Um, all right. Okay. Um, you know, just to segue from the last question about uh, do people really believe the problem is, uh, is so big? So um, I'm doing a startup, and um, last week I met with a uh, early stage VC in New England. Still raising money, Dick. Good. <laughs> Still raising money over here. Met with a VC in New England. At 76, we stopped investing. Yes. Um, and they decided to pass uh, because they wanted to see the green is a passing fad in the boardroom. That is a direct quote. A direct quote. And <laughs> it really pissed me off. So uh, I, did, I did a clean tech startup starting in 2005 when I was trying to raise money for consumer facing a clean tech startup. And that was the kind of thing I got then. <laughs> I sent them mm -hmm. an email. Really? You guys really think this? And then he, got, he sent me an email back and said, I don't like your tone. <laughs> 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 it's un really, it's, I mean, it's, we can all sit in here and be like, oh yeah, this is gosh, this is the worst thing ever. There are people out there who really are just so cavalier about it, it's shocking. And, uh, whatever. Um, so I'm just starting the, the presentation here to just kind of level set the group uh, that you know, the definition of sustainability <coughs> encompasses three primary tenants, which is environmental sustainability, social responsibility, and economic viability. And for the most part, in the conversations we've been having here, we've been talking about really environmental sustainability. We haven't been talking about social metrics and social impact. I just want to put that out there, that if we use the word sustainability, we're not using it completely uh, to its true definition. So I, I actually tend to use the phrase environmental sustainability just to make that clear. So <laughs> this group, um, you know, we have a lot, lot in common, and I'm actually reusing some of the slides that I used last year in, in my keynote, so I'm using the word here, but uh, this is actually one of the slides from my investor presentation. There really are real business drivers driving uh, environmental sustainability. Um, in the U.S., it's these three, and I can get the cursor to work, it's these three that are really the drivers uh, of reputation, this is reduction, but also product innovation and revenue driven from uh, new products, new businesses, new markets from uh, greater, greater products. Uh, regulation may come, but that's not the driver. And so today, um, this is a, a, a real life example, just to again give people on the ground how uh, eco design is being done. This is a real project. This is a big multinational manufacturer hired a well renowned. Uh, industrial design firm to redesign the packaging with this stipulation that the new packaging be greener than the uh, current packaging. And so uh, this design firm came back with two scenarios, um, both illustrating uh, a sustainable strategy, right? One is a recycled cardboard option, the other is a hard plastic case and take back program. And so when the client said, great, you know, wh which one's greener? I don't know. And so that's pretty much how things are being done today. It's, it's very intuitive. Um, you know, if, if we're using something recycled or if we cut out a chemical, you know, that's, that makes it greener. But, you know, in the context of, of Doc's presentation, uh, how do we know what's, an, what's an, a meaningful improvement? What's just incremental or what actually has um, some, some profound implications to that set of choices? Um, so, the definition to product life cycle um, that is used in the <coughs> sustainability space really looks at uh, the whole system from raw material acquisition through component manufacture, uh, use phase, and various end-of-life dispositions with transportation and distribution in between. And so this is actually the mindset that uh, has to be adopted now across all design and manufacturing to 
realize that uh, we are incumbent now to own the whole product system, not just the artifact, uh, and not just you know cradle to gate, but from the whole beginning to the end. And all of those things need to be uh, accounted for um, in the design process. So uh, this only has to happen at the early stage of design, and this is the best uh, economic reason, which is um, you know 75 percent of the manufacturing costs are covered by the end of the concept stage of design. You pretty much know what you're making, and it turns out those same decisions. Uh, about what the product is going to be and how you make it lock in the environmental performance of the product. So if you don't have insight into the environmental <coughs> performance of that product early on, just like anything else, it's too expensive and too late to make changes later. Uh, I, I became, as I was kind of studying this space, I became a collector of, of uh, product life cycle diagrams. Um, <coughs> Tells you a lot about a company when you see how they think about product life cycles. Just pulling them off the web. This is actually my favorite one. I was really happy to find this. This is from 2007. Um, and IDC, I was pleased that IDC was excited about this too. Um, here, HP has their diagram of product life cycle. Um, and what they've done right here is stuck design as the first phase in the product life cycle. So before raw material acquisition, we have a design phase where we're actually thinking about what we're doing. I thought that was pretty powerful. Uh, these images are from um, the storage stuff. How many of you guys have seen the storage stuff? It's great. Everybody. All right, great. What I love about the story of stuff is um, they tell the story of what's broken about uh, product life cycle in a way that consumers can understand. And so when Annie tells the story, she talks about how we essentially destroy the planet when we get raw materials out, we pollute when we manufacture stuff, eat, beat, and treat. Uh, here's, here's the social part. You know, we sell products in these big box stores at price points that aren't realistic. You know, we're not really paying the true cost of the products that we consume. Those costs are being uh, sloughed off onto the environment and onto people who we don't really pay, or pay their wage to. And then, as Doc was saying, we take it home and fill it <coughs> up with stuff that we don't necessarily need. And then, when we throw it away, we put more toxins into the environment. And so, uh, this is, and again, I used this slide last year, which was to say look, with so many points of uh, problems, there's so many points of intervention. Intervention means opportunity, and there's so many opportunities for innovation in the way we make our software products to help designers and engineers actually make better decisions about the way they make products. So the new way is to put innovation or design in front of product life cycle, and in fact, now uh, what I've done here is I've mapped um, the eco-design strategy wheel from Ocala. Do you, do you know Philip, Philip White? Okay. Um, uh, and there are other uh, strategy, there's a lot of strategy work out there in the world, but the idea is that there are strategies that can be employed at every phase of the product life cycle uh, that can uh, improve the environmental performance of the way we make products. And so, like any good strategy framework, you can use it as an analysis tool. And so I went to the website. For Herman Miller and for Caterpillar, that's their remanufacturing services. They're taking back the equipment and, and repurposing it and reselling it. Um, just pretty quickly, just from looking at some marketing stuff, you can use this framework to understand uh, what they did. And in any good innovation play, using multiple strategies from multiple points uh, in the process. Um, means that uh, you're likely to create some pretty powerful innovation. So, what what they're showing, what I'm showing here is, they were addressing each of these folks were addressing different points in the product life cycle, employing many strategies within each of those points, and have come up with pretty powerful innovative solutions. So, the challenge is, how do we provide software that allows, or tools that allow designers and planners and engineers 
to model the entire product system so that we can start actually thinking and working this way. So uh, enter life cycle assessment and um, LCA has been around for about 30 or 40 years. Uh, it's been the principal means that people have used to assess the greenness of products and uh, what it does is it evaluates the environmental and human health impacts associated with everything in the product life cycle. And uh, the challenge with LCA right now is that it's, it's a pretty rarefied field of science. There aren't that many practitioners in the world that uh, are skilled and qualified to perform LCAs. They're very expensive. Um, uh, and most importantly, uh, they are not designed and not all that helpful in uh, the concept stages of design. The LCA has prim primarily been used for reporting and policy decisions. Uh, ISO standards or ISO guidelines govern how uh, reporting comes out of LCA. Uh, you have to do LCAs on finished products uh, to be able to report um, and make competitive public performance claims. So right there, that kind of puts the kibosh on uh, making them practical for early stage design. Um, and ultimately, you know, we need tools to be aligned with processes. This is a quick primer of how, of how LCA works. Um, so, <clears throat> we say this question, how does a bill of materials translate to environmental impacts? Okay. So, over here, um, here at Sustainable Minds, we coined this term system bill of materials. So it's not just your traditional bomb, it's the whole product. <coughs> it's a system bill of materials. So all of these things in the product system, from materials to transportation to end-of-life values, they're all uh, either created from chemicals or they create chemicals in their consumption. And those chemicals um, in LCA parlance are referred to as process inventory data. This is a sample list of process inventory data, also known as life cycle inventory data, the acronym LCI data. When this, in when this data is put through the lens of a methodology, all of the chemicals can then be attributed to one or more categories of impact. And this is probably a complete list of all of the impact categories that scientists have identified. And all of these categories can then be attributed to one or more categories of damage, either to human health or to the environment. That's how LCA works. So, a couple years ago we saw the opportunity um, and the need to bring um, LCA uh, tools, thinking and practices into the hands of generalist designers and manufacturers. Um, and uh, the technology that exists in the world uh, has gotten to a place where that's become possible. And so our company, Sustainable Minds, was founded uh, on the premise that we were going to bring knowledge and tools into mainstream uh, product design so that we could uh, enable uh, regular mechanical engineers and designers to integrate LCA into their uh, standard design practices. Uh, so in, in, in my vision of the future, every designer and engineer's desktop uh, consists of uh, their CAD tools, their rendering tools, and sustainable minds. Um, we uh, analyzed for 10 environmental impact categories across ecological damage, resource depletion, and human health damage. And the basis for our methodology, which is called APALA, comes from science conducted at the EPA and, and at NIST. Um, OCALA uh, is a single factor scoring system. And this is how we made it simpler for designers and engineers. We reduced the uh, impacts from each of these 10 categories into a single figure score. Um, so if you just scan up and down the list, this is a sample list of polymers, for example, you scan up and down the list, the higher the score, the greater the impacts overall, the lower the score, the lesser the impacts. Uh, so these are relative values. Over here, we've taken the global warming score um, and converted it into pounds of CO2 equivalents, and those are absolute values. So what we have here is, what this line means is that for every pound of LDP primary that's produced, 
And so that looks at the raw material acquisition, the transportation, the manufacturing impacts of making a pound of LDP primary. It has an Akala impact score of 14, and it has a CO2 equivalency value of 0.88 pounds. So for every pound of LDP primary produced, 0.88 pounds of CO2 is produced. What does the term normalization mean in this context? Um, it simply means uh, characterizing uh, this data to North American consumption patterns. So Akala is an impact assessment methodology for products that are consumed in North America. Um, that was something I, I didn't mention before. There's probably about 10 methodologies in the whole world for measuring environmental impact, and they are created for um, regional uh, measure. Do you know how these data have been validated? Yeah, we use um, uh, RLCI data from EcoInvent and all the other databases that all the other LCA tools use. Um, the EPA work has been peer reviewed, the NIST work has been peer reviewed. So yeah, I've been uh, appalled really at the uh, quality of the data in yeah. the building world at least. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's a big, big problem. Like I think our data is a big problem, so lack of data and but, lack okay. of... What do, you, what do you see as the primary problem? We, I have not run across one building where we have validated our design intent against what was actually built against how it's actually performing okay. in close to mm -hmm. This is an issue that I bring up at the end. I mean, the data issue is the most profound centralized issue, but one of the, you know, the real bottleneck is that the process for creating LCI data is very sophisticated and very complex, and because it's science, it's disputed, right? Different mm -hmm. people do it in different ways. So one of the challenges, and, and the reason that we use licensed data, even though there's a whole open source LCI movement, is to maintain um, you know, some kind of quality as well as um, having the same system boundaries on, on how the data is what's included in the when you're when you're looking at the life cycle for manufacturing products where does the life cycle end in other words where does the assessment end at the, when the product is retired and reused and so you're looking right, at it's whatever end of life process yeah. that you model for so are you taking into a well in the building industry it's <coughs> you know one of the complicating factors is that we're looking at operational cost and 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 Right. energy consumption during the operational period. Right. So um, what we're focusing on is products um, because, and the reason that I chose to do that is because um, with, with LEED and USGBC and BIM, you know, kind of building is kind of on its way. In the product side of the world, there's no USGBC equivalent. Right. There's no... There's no standards, there's no metrics, there's no educational program. Um, and people don't think about product systems this way. So there's just this, there's a big lag. <laughs> I mean, you're having your own troubles in the building world, but manufacturing hasn't even started. You know? So, so in the product world, it turns out that uh, Peter Drucker has told us for 40 years that the majority of successful products and 90 percent of the consumption of them was for purposes that the designer never dreamed of. Right. So how does that square with doing a life cycle analysis when you have no idea who's going to be using those products for what for how long? Well, that's the opportunity. Right, no, okay. there's dream sheet numbers. <coughs> dream. Great conceptual design to do a life cycle analysis. Uh, and my point to you is that the people sitting there have no idea right. what the life cycle of that product is going to be. Well, it's different though. Oh, that's right. And then you show us a multi attribute map. Well, remember and then you reduce it all to one number. I think there's also probably a comparative nature of it that, well, probably each analysis isn't perfect. You can compare that sort of thing to some other boat. You know, and uh, that's what trying to get right. to. Not the best number, but uh, an optimal design uh, of the many choices you have. I understand that because you move back to the analysis validated. Well, it's a question. Yeah. Some products are much worse than that when I was in the a vehicle. You kind of know it, how many miles it's going to go and about what the impact will be. And if 
horizontal approximately. Yes, sir. It's a product we've known about for 50 years. Now, and tell me it's about a nano. Brand new and it takes tell me about a nano machine yeah. that's got a nano control of Earth. Now then, scale that up and where's it going to go and how do you space that works. And I regard that as a huge problem. I know at Purdue University, for instance, is there, like most of them now, they want to do the incubators and spin off things. But one of the most valuable institutes is thermodynamic properties that everybody uses data from that. I don't know if that's where it came from. It's been around for a long time, but nobody really wants to put that much money into the data. And there's no, you know, at least so far, it's just free information. It should be, but somebody's got to do that. I would say, in defense of the sustainable minds approach, that I don't see your analysis focusing so much on how it's used, but what are the materials and what are the processes that go into it, and what yeah, happens well, to the there is, So, to get back to Jack's question, which is, which is <coughs> spot on, yep. we are saying to the product design team, you are modeling energy in the use phase, consumables in the use phase, you are choosing the functional unit, the unit of time or the unit of measure that you are going to define uh, for this product because durability is, is a really right. important uh, question. And in fact, the key to doing life cycle assessment is actually thinking about the functional unit or the unit of service delivered and how many of those units of service delivered, how are you going to measure that? And that's, how, that's actually the core of the assessment. Um, I don't want to, I'm happy to like give you a demo and take take this offline, but the point is, you're getting people to think this way and giving them tools to be able to model it, so that as Buzz said, uh, our, our premise is there is no such thing as a green product. Right? All products use materials, they all create energy, all create waste, it's all about comparison. And ultimately understanding what are the improvements or the changes that you can make that create meaningful improvements and not just incremental improvements. So going back to the, you know, the cardboard versus the take that program plastic case. The card. Well, anyway, the point is meaningful right. versus. Uh, so what I'm trying to understand, I think you've answered it. At least my question is, uh, they, the design. You're asking the designers to take into account the environmental impacts of the operational phase of the product. Correct. And what you're saying is it can be used in ways that might not be predicted, but at least they're at least they're making a forecast and they're um, we're asking them to absolutely think about right. and, what is and they're documenting the intended use. So if it is used as in an other than intended manner, at least they have a baseline to evaluate you know, the But but my, the, my difficulty that I'm having is that people who make forecasts should also forecast the probable error in their forecast. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. and I don't right. see that here. Well, let's say you're trying to make a decision based on the best available information. Right. Uh, let's say your goal is to, is to uh, manufacture a product that has uh, the least negative environmental impact. Um, I think the methodology is valid from that perspective because it comes back to a comparative analysis of two different products. Right. Okay. And this we're, is absolutely... We're considering an atom machine that will win and stitch a hurt valve. Mm-hmm. Now, tell me what I'm going to do here. Well, so maybe that's an example of um, you know, after you do experience how it's used. That would be 12 years from now. So the design will run the analysis and mm -hmm. work in version two. Yeah. Oh, that's not 12 years. Plus. So the way yeah, yeah, that's 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 you're, you're raising all the right questions. So the way that this process works is you start with a reference product. And so in the case of a redesign, you collect as much data as you can about the existing product. And getting, getting access to the yeah, data sure. is a big challenge right now, right? Mm -hmm. In the case of a new product, you're going to go look at competitive products, get whatever data you can on which to base your assumptions. But just as you said, yeah. you're doing think, the best you can I to think, model what it's And going I think to the be. product you're describing, environmental impact, is not the overriding criteria. I mean, if I have to choose between two heart valves, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be making my decision based on the life cycle impact of the environment. <laughs> 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 point you're making. Though, That's you know? right. It's right. impossible to know what you can't know. Well, but this mm -hmm. is the problem with any kind of predictive sure. framework. Right. I mean, and there are approaches like Bayesian statistics that do incorporate past knowledge a little bit more comprehensively and, 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 and allow you to parameterize how accurate your future predictions are. But, but 
but that's yeah, still but very approximate. I mean, well, we can't. We well, can't. They're, they're all approximations. Yeah, they're you all get approximations. into like, you know, yeah. <laughs> most of the data is pretty imprecise anyway. So I, I think you've got a good case to talk about. I, I don't know of the thing, but I'd like to know more about it. And you're not trying to anticipate everything. If you can just anticipate the big chunks and don't make a big mistake. But uh, the other thing is, in the director's time, I think there were a lot fewer products than there are today, right? You look at store shelves, we have so many products on the shelves, and everything is very, very specialized, especially what you just described. And so no one's going to be hammering a nail, right, with, with what you described. And so we do have a better, for certain classes of products, we have a much better sense of how they're going to be used. There's only certain things I'm going to do with my iPhone. Right, and it's a pretty well bounded. You know, I've got all sorts of different software I can run it, but again, I'm not going to hammer a nail with it. Versus, I tried it works. <laughs> 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 you know, I want to clear up, but it's a good example. Yeah, 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 small yeah, in number. You know, but that's one of the most popular apps for it. Right, oh, which is fine, but but again, it's not. It's not clear that would affect the greenness of the product. Well, exactly. That's my point. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to get so bogged down this point because I still want to move forward, but. The last, the last point I want to make on this is that it's been my understanding from just talking to people in companies that product lifetime is one of the things that inside companies nobody discloses. It's like the well-kept secret. How long has this product been designed to last? Mm -hmm. And so now when you get into really having to look at how are we going to measure the uh, service delivered from this product, it becomes core to the discussion of what are we making. Yeah. And that's why we name the company Sustainable Minds. Well, if, we can, if we can cause a mind shift mm -hmm. that people start understanding they own the entire <coughs> product system and they can model with a little bit of data, I mean, we, have, we have customers who go into conference rooms and they're starting a new design project and they will literally go, okay, what if we tried this thing, and we went this way, and then we tried this other way, we did this other thing. And they can quickly, they can put like eight or nine things into the system bomb and quickly model it and see, you know, where in the product life cycle the impacts are, what's causing the greatest impacts, and it begins to just put them in another direction. And the more specific the data that goes into the model, the more specific the output. So it can be used throughout the entire my only point is that that's all good if, in fact, they estimate this error in their forecast. If they don't, I guarantee you those forecasts will make things worse than the Earth exists today. You know what? It's all data in. What's that expression? Garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. So don't do that. Yeah. yeah. You've got to use good <laughs> techniques that make them, right. that help them. Forecast the yeah. error in their forecast. Or, or even better, you know, what, what are yeah. the assumptions? Okay. Can I make right. a comment? Yes. In the I make a comment. It's a start. 80% of the deals I go into fail. I can't tell which one there is, but I know if I don't go into any of them, they all fail. So it's a start. The weather forecasting system, economics, forecasting, technology, modeling, automobiles, all were, in hindsight, dumb things. And you've got a nice dumb start. Don't let them wear you down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, so talking about being worn down, I've been trying to raise money now for a year for this company. There were some doctors in Germany in 1944. And, uh, That's right. And what I, what I had to do, so going out to speak to investors, you know, the, the whole carbon management thing has been getting a lot of airplay. So I go to speak to investors and they say, well, how are you like Claire Sanders? Or how are you like... You know, one of these other startups that uh, is doing uh, carbon management across the enterprise, and said, okay, well, we're not really like that at all, although we do allow the designer to understand the impacts of carbon. And so just to be able to explain the sector that our software was in, I had to create a new category that I called sustainability performance software and started to characterize, okay, there's this category of carbon management software, and there's uh, some different purposes, and I included a few examples of companies that are doing this. And there's enterprise sustainable performance software for organizations to measure attributes across the entire 
enterprise. And there's packaging software. There's new software from the uh, Sustainable Packaging Coalition out of Green Blue. Uh, Walmart uh, hired a company to build a, it's actually just the software is called package modeling software. And if you use it to model your package to report to Walmart. And now here's our category, products. So LCA software has existed for a while for expert practitioners. And P International is the company that uh, SolidWorks is working with on their product. Uh, here's our little category, LCA-based eco design, environmental sustainability software, product design, teams using concept stage. And here's a new one that I added, data-driven data software for manufacturers to validate bombs for compliance, which is synaptic, synapsis, here's John. Okay. Um, right. And so uh, what it begs the question is, what's next for product sustainability performance software? So here's what people, you know, from now two years of working with designers and engineers and consultancies and manufacturing uh, product development teams. So people want to be able to model and assess the environmental performance of, now we're talking about a whole product system, but they're used to this idea of a bomb. But what's in a bomb is just materials. There's, there's no processes, there's no use phase, there's no end of life. So um, very limited data in a bomb. And then even within that, people want to be able to assess a subassembly or a part. And that's what SolidWorks is, is enabling from the bottom up, which I love. They want to be able to assess and validate for environmental compliance. They want to do all of the above at different points during the design and engineering process with various levels of ease and specificity. And they want to be able to do life cycle costing to be able to support green trade-off decisions. Because our software is just decision support software. That's all it is. We don't even, we're not even a green rating system. It's just the comparative value, right, that you can take real data into your decision-making process about what to make and compare it with cost and performance and all that. So, but the point, the reason I purposefully and typographically did it like this is that we need to be able to model the entire product system, right? So if you go from the bottom up, this is a little piece this is a slightly bigger piece, but this is the whole piece, right? Um, so tools have to be aligned with uh, the product development process, and they have to be appropriate for the knowledge and skills of the user, obviously. All right, so what needs to happen to make all this possible? And I, I, my disqualifier is uh, what lawyers like to say, includes but is not limited to. Um, so in the engineering software industry, it would be nice if there were standardized taxonomy for materials and processes to support interoperability between systems. Um, knowledge of material information in PLM would be very useful. Uh, component manufacturers supplying environmental impact data in their data sheets. So the challenge is there is how will they do that? What format will that data take? What about the credibility and accuracy of the reporting? And that gets back to value of data. Um, access to information to model product systems is not easily acquired. Uh, so it means uh, people throughout the organization have to capture data in different ways. And so integration with ERP and life cycle costing, but new data captured. In the LCA community, uh, life cycle process inventory data. Uh, for many more materials and processes and the life values needs to be created, which means uh, there needs to be more ways of creating LCI data, thus the open source LCI movement. Um, and um, finally, this is a big one, uh, setting performance goals, metrics, and standards. Uh, the first thing is understanding what's important to measure and why. Um, and we can get into offline a whole discussion between the importance of measuring process flows versus environmental impacts. The so process flows are things like embodied energy, water use, solid waste production, but uh, that's tricky. There's, there's issues when you're just measuring those things that can be misleading. All of those things ultimately lead to environmental impacts, so when is it appropriate to measure and report on each of those things? Industries will have to set for themselves environmental performance metrics because what's important in one industry 
the damage that they're doing in one industry may not be the same as damage in other industries, so that will be different. Um, then within that, companies will need to set environmental performance policies and goals within each industry. <coughs> the government is going to need to be involved ultimately, which leads to reporting and communication to stakeholders. Uh, FTC has guidelines, ISO has guidelines. Um, how will we know what to say and report? We, we did a blog post on a few of these things. Um, about which system is better to measure with and some other stuff. If you go to uh, sustainableminds.com, there's a lot of free content. I urge you to go there. But um, anyway, what needs to happen to make all this possible? I talked about earlier is a massive shift in values and behavior. And what gives me a little bit of faith is uh, the CEO of GE a few weeks ago in reference to the economic downturn said, uh, be assured, this is a reset. This isn't a return. I don't think we're going to see a return in values to aspiring to have free cars in the driveway. And I think our values are going to be reset coming out of this. So that's, that bodes well. And the wrap up is that at the end of the day, companies will purchase all types of sustainability performance software because companies measure what matters. And at some point, all those systems will need to interoperate. Uh, and that's a challenge again. Yeah. Last night on, on the data problem, Paul Chalmer, a dick, you know Paul Chalmer, National Center for Manufacturing Sciences, has a project to collect base data on energy requirements and carbon footprint of common materials and parts. Now, companies don't want to disclose a lot of that, but NCMS being a neutral party, they'll collect this, and what he's putting together is a base case database. It's not the greatest, but it's a place to start. I don't know how many other projects there are like it, but it's a very worthwhile project. Because and it's supported by the, we're a government agency and we're here to help you. Mm -hmm. That's not bad. <laughs> but there, it's there. a start. It's a place. It's a start. Right. It may be a dumb start, but it's a start. It's, it's, it's like that center at Purdue, you know, just a little dab of tax money went into that. But it's a very important tax point. Money. I'd like a dab of tax money, please. <laughs> what, who would carry on your modeling the whole product? Does that carry out to the product at point of use? Sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because we're finding the logistics uh, causes some more problems than the product. No question about it. I, I love the, here's an example. I love this story. A friend of mine, an LCA expert, when I first started looking into this space, he had been hired by Levi's to do an LCA on their 501 jeans. Uh, Levi's being very environmentally conscientious. They thought that their greatest impacts were going to be from transportation of cotton, because they grow cotton all around the world. It turned out the greatest impacts from a pair of 501 jeans is in the use phase, because people wash them in hot water and dry them in the dryer far more impactful than shipping cotton from Egypt because it turns out they were very efficient. They pack it in very efficient bales, they put it on a freighter, goes across the ocean, very efficient. Absolutely. So my teenagers are efficient then because they never wash them? Absolutely. <laughs> That's right. We've got to give Rick an opportunity here. Everybody give Terry a big hand.